Graphic warning, graphic warning. This lecture is full of pictures showing, well, what you can see right now on your screen. So be prepared. Starting with lecture 2.3, we will be discussing common eye conditions and pathologies and how they can be surgically corrected. First on our list is traumatic proptosis. Let's start. Yep, second slide. Warned you about the graphic content, didn't I? Well, look at this picture of this poor, poor dog. Looks bad, doesn't it? Before we discuss the different surgical options for such a case, we have to understand the condition first. Traumatic proptosis is defined as the forward eye displacement due to trauma. Trauma can be from a dog bite, being hit by a car, or falling from a height and hitting their head. This force can cause a sudden forward globe displacement from the orbital cavity. Remember, the term globe also means the eyeball. This displacement happens simultaneously with the entrapment of the eyelids behind the globe. These forces acting together causes venous congestion on the surrounding areas of the affected eye, eventually leading to the inflammation of the retrobulbar contents. The effects can range from corneal ulceration, retrobulbar edema, hemorrhage, and of course, blindness. When this patient is brought into your clinic, what will you do first? Any plans, guesses? First thing that you do to the dog, not to the client. I don't want to hear answers of, ma'am, what happened? No, what will you do to the animal? Hmm. Well, first, you assess the demeanor of the animal. Will it let you touch its body? Is it aggressive? Is it protective of its owner? Is it showing signs of pain, fear, anxiety? You have to evaluate the animal first from a distance. Once you have figured out if you can touch it or not, during physical examination, you must lather generous amounts of topical lubricants on the proptosed eyeball. Remember, the eyeball is kept moist and protected within the orbit by the continual secretions from the lacrimal gland. Now that it is displaced outside of the orbit, it is dry, it is inflamed, it is damaged, and it needs to be kept moist and protected. Next, you must administer systemic analgesia to address the pain of the animal, even if the animal is not showing signs of pain. Look at this dog. Its eye is, is really looking bad. Of course there's pain. With this, you must thoroughly assess the patient's general physical condition and other signs of possible traumatic injuries, especially if the initial trauma that caused this condition is um, a dog bite, or a hit by car. For sure, there are other injuries that need your attention. After all those are done, and now you want to focus on the eye, you must assess, sorry, assess the viability. Can it be saved? Is it still functional? Will it even return to its normal function if we put it back? These questions must be answered for you to provide the correct treatment. There are two general things we need to check, the structural damage on the eye and the vision and reflexes. Let's discuss this one by one. Proptosis in brachycephalic breeds, like a pug, happens so often because of their inherent anatomy. They have shallow orbits, very prominent globes, or what we call luwa ang mata, and large palpebral fissures. Even the wrong kind of restraint can cause their eyes to proptose. In assessing for the eye viability, the extent of the eye damage and its associated structures 
need to be evaluated. The eye is said to be proptosed when there is avulsion of two or more periocular muscles. If you noticed, in our previous pictures, the eye is displaced at a certain direction, dorsolateral displacement. However, in this picture of the POG, you could see that there is a variation to that. A ventral lateral displacement can also occur. In the former, a dorsolateral displacement means that the muscles which hold the eye medially and ventrally are the first one to lose their tension. These are the medial rectus, the ventral rectus, and the medial oblique muscles. At times, the damage is so severe that the optic nerve is seen already from the outside. But note, it doesn't automatically mean that the eye is non-functional. You must check the pupil for dilation, which is a sign of oculomotor and optic nerve damage. You also have to assess how severe the corneal damage is. And of course, the presence of hyphema is also a sign of damage to the ciliary body. Hold up, you do know what hyphema means, right? Right? <laughs> hyphema um, basically is the presence of blood inside the eye. You can actually see it from the outside. If you shine a light, you, all you see is blood, all you see is red, then that is a bad sign and will point to uh, a poor prognosis for the eye viability. Assessing the eye viability entails checking the pupillary light reflex. This reflex is a normal physiologic response to the light striking the retina. The normal response to that is pupillary constriction or pupillary meiosis. A fixed dilated pupil would mean damage to the optic nerve, the oculomotor nerve, or the ciliary ganglia. But how is this done? Do you still remember from Fischl 1, neurological exam? It's totally okay if you can't remember, because we are going to discuss it now. Checking the pupillary light reflex is a vital part of a neurologic exam. If you watch medical dramas, you might notice that doctors automatically check the eyes of the patient with a light as a part of their neurologic exam and establishment of a brain function. So how do we do this for our patients? First, the room light must be dimmed. If it cannot be, go to a room wherein there is no light at all. You take a pen light, which may be a yellow light or a white light. What is better is debatable. And this light is directed into the affected eye. The normal response of a functional eye is pupillary constriction, as you can see right here. The light striking the retina will send a signal to the ciliary muscles to contract and cause the pupil to constrict. Now, if this is the affected eye, and this is where you shine the light, the response that you will measure is what we call the direct PLR. However, you must also check the response of the other eye, even if your light is shown here. The response of the other eye is what we call consensual or indirect PLR. And this eye must constrict as well. So, an intact PLR with no functional vision is still possible since the reflex only requires a few number of intact or functional photoreceptors. On the other hand, an impaired PLR but there is normal vision can be seen in three scenarios. If a parasympathetic drug is administered to the eye, like atropine or tropicamide, if the sphincter muscles are atrophied, or there is an underlying problem with the nerves. 
Increased intraocular pressure will also limit the pupil constriction in the affected eye. If there is increased IOP, the pupil will constrict at a much slower pace than a normal eye. Fun fact, look at this image right here. This animal has a constricted pupil on the right eye and a dilated pupil on the left eye. What is this condition called? Wherein there is an equal size of the eye's pupils. Does anyone know what it is? Try to write it. It's called uh, me so I feel dumb doing this. I could have just put a text box, but anyway. Anisocoria. So this is the medical term for that. An equal size of the eyes pupils. The choice of what surgical management to do for patients suffering from proptosis depends on the assessed viability of the prolapsed eye. In cases wherein there are indications of a functional eye, a globe can be replaced, and this choice entails three surgeries, lateral canthotomy, globe reduction or replacement, and temporary tarsography. However, if the eye has suffered from extensive damage and there is no function after you do your physical and neurologic examination, the eye is removed through enucleation or exenteration. We will discuss these procedures in detail in the next videos.